go. All righty. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Em. I'm one of the librarians at here Rockland Public, at Rockland Public Library. We're so thrilled to be hosting tonight's event. Uh, I want to start off by quickly introducing a couple of the next events that are coming up at the library. Um, next Thursday at 6.30, we're going to be hosting our first Camden Conference talk of the season, um, which is with Kristen Bacassi, and it's called The Politics of Critical Mineral Supply Chains in the Indo-Pacific. She's a, a professor at UA, and she's really incredibly knowledgeable about the topic, and we're so excited for that. And then the week after that, we're welcoming uh, Susan Han Shutterly, who's a main essayist, to talk about her new book, The Notes on the Landscape of Home. And I'm happy to turn it over to Ann Morris, who's the curator of the uh, Rockland Historical Society, who is very graciously co-hosting tonight's event. And I'll turn it right over to her. Go right ahead. Yay. Well, I'm so glad you're here. We have lots of donut holes in, in the Historical <laughs> Society. And I've already tried to make the piles a little bit smaller. And so I said, oh, good. And that, as soon as Alexis does her program, we'll go down there um, and have fun. Um, I want to tell you that our annual meeting will be coming up November 19th. It's a Saturday afternoon. It'll be, um, I think it's going to be from 2 no, one. to 3. Three, one, okay, one to three or something yeah. like that. Because the library and, closes. At yeah, four. the library closes at four on Saturdays. Yeah. But anyway, we'll have a notice about it in the paper, and any of you who are members will get an email about it. And um, but for tonight, this is really going to be fun. Um, Alexis Yamarino is an artist and an educator. And she has worked with um, CMCA's Art Lab, and she has she's responsible for the Arts in Action murals that are all over the buildings in Rockland. They're very fun. And um, it's going to be even more fun tonight when Alexis tells us all she knows about donuts. <laughs> so, take it away. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for coming out. And um, I don't know as you walked in the front door, if many of you did, but it says, um, I think, I love my library, and the library loves you. Is that what it says, Annie? Yes. Or M? Pardon me? Um, and so I just want to say thank you so much to the library. And um, these projects really are, it just so happens that that's the very first thing that I'd like to start with, is that these, these public curatorial projects that I'm engaged in are so rooted in institutions such as the library, such as a local regional historical society. So really these cultural institutions that have a collective of stewards who all come to it with very different um, desires, hopes, dreams. Um, the reasons why they choose to maintain these institutions is really what I'm most connected to as a public and community artist. So I just want to say, yes, I value our libraries. Um, you must also value and love your library. And um, if you haven't spent some time at the Historical Society, which is just right behind you here, how many in the room here have um, visited or visit regularly our Rockland Historical Society? Oh, yeah, it's like preaching to the choir. <laughs> so, um, yes, I love our Historical Society. This is, um, as I'm talking, I'm just going to go ahead. I've done this in the past. And if it's not too jarring for y'all, I'm going to um, just, this is a, a, I'm going to speed up, this I think I said about five, about five times, is it two, oh, it's a little bit too fast, hold on, we'll go back to two. Um, just as I'm talking, you can kind of see the, the publication um, that I'm going to be talking a little bit, a bit about tonight is, here, just going to scroll as I'm sharing. And the whole, you're seeing in front of you, yes, a community artist, but really uh, my work is connected to um, a very deep collaboration. So the book that you're seeing scrolling here is the result of a kindling grant, which I received in 2017. And um, I received the grant to create um, a publication of an art exhibition 
that happened in 2016. <laughs> this is the original shirt. <laughs> and um, I would not have been able to um, create this book had it not been for um, this collaboration that I share uh, with my uh, friend Maeve O'Regan. And she and I run a gallery space together in Thomaston called Interlock. And so not only is the book sort of, again, like this ode and this um, letter, uh, kind of love letter to the town and my connection to this place, but it is also sort of, it marks the beginning of this really powerful collaboration that I have with Maeve um, in the curatorial and artwork that we do. So um, she is a designer. This is the, the physical book exists here. Um, I'll be reading a little bit from it tonight. Um, it is also um, a book that exists as a public history document. So we printed 125 copies of this book and uh, we gifted them to historical societies and libraries throughout the state. So in addition to that, each participating artist um, received a complimentary copy of the book. And so the book is at the heart of this exhibition. I essentially curated the exhibition to create the book, to donate it. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> Stick with me. Um, furthermore, each object in the catalog for me serves as a primary source. Um, I am the, the curator and the collector and the kind of the steward of these things, right? But it, I really made it my goal in this work to not um, editorialize too heavily or to sort of say like, this does or doesn't you know, belong. It's really like an open driven mix. Um, I really wanna say yes to most everything in the hopes that you as cognizant and sentient beings will uh, come to your own uh, decisions about your tastes on the matter, uh, whether you know uh, you do or don't believe the content of the thing. And so much of the work that I do as a, um, an arts educator is really relies on that. It relies on um, people um, not just always saying like, oh, I don't like it, and like walking out the door. It's like mm -hmm. part of my job is to really say like, what do you see that's happening here? What kind of makes you feel like I, you don't want to spend another minute here? Because the person who made the thing, right, it, this is their, it's a thing that they've brought into the world and they wouldn't have done it if they didn't have some reason for doing so, unless the reason is to have no reason at all, which maybe you know people like that. Um, so I think what I'll do here is you kind of, this is just, I think, hope giving a sense of like the, the tenor and the difference of the objects uh, that were submitted, and this really is again just like an ode to, um, yeah, this thing that happened and is now continued on, and here we are in 2022. So I would like to, I'm gonna let this pause a minute here. I'm just gonna scrub forward a little bit to this section of the catalog. Um, I will say I, I did I like planned this out for you, but. There's so many directions that this talk can go that I'm just the kind of presenter that essentially I'm gonna kind of skim through and find things that I think will uh, connect to, I see so many of my fellow historical society board members here. And so I also see this as an opportunity to sort of create some um, connections between how and why the contemporary art in this exhibit um, does have its roots in the history of Maine I am not a historian. I'm, a, as I said, community artist, public, you know, curatorial project leader, these sorts of things. But um, in the company of historians, I do like to uh, insert a little, if not maybe it's like credibility, but it's like there is, there's a lot of historical um, evidence uh, inserted in the, the catalog, but it is meant to be seen in concert with the, the contemporary and abstract works. So I just like to read, um, See if I, I wish I could make this a little crisper, but this is, um, I guess I can, there we go. That's kind of nice. Should I turn my eyes up? Oh, you can, as long as I can read, okay. Um, let's see here. Oh, that's just, that's awesome. So uh, this is, uh, I'm just gonna read some excerpts from this because again, it was important to me that the catalog contain well, essentially, I, I reached out to a number of food historians because I realized I haven't told you. Oh, I have to tell you something. <laughs> oh, no, I forgot to tell you about the origin of the story. Uh, I gotta tell you a story real fast. 
In 2014, I was visiting with a small group at the Rockland Historical Society while researching for a community mural. We were learning all about the sort of superlatives and the things that make this place great, the things that people have a sense of place and connection to, of which there are many. Um, and in the midst of all of this kind of bragging and loving of place and making a sense of like, oh, I was like, oh, I'm so glad to be here. One man said, we also invented the donut. Across the table, another man matter-of-factly replied, we didn't invent the donut, we put the hole in it. I'm going to go off script a minute, but essentially, you know, so I say, oh, I was intrigued, I was flabbergasted that such a claim could be attributed to a singular place or individual. But because of my background in community art and my love of history, I know that this is at the heart of American history, is this kind of battle at times between people sort of uh, self-proclaiming like a start date. You get city and corporation dates that are so bombastic, completely erase the history that came before. You get someone saying, you know, well, my, my mother did this thing and isn't, you know, they can go into detail. I'm going to share a, an oral history here. But sort of like who and how credit gets given is to absolutely part of the mechanisms of history. And so the stories that we tell around our local history, yeah, land squarely in like your own sense of belief and like why and you know, why you believe it, what structures exist around that. So, how many of you are familiar with this story? <laughs> um, how many, I mean, I, I suppose, when you hear a story like that, you know, it says, you know, I've got a great, I mean, now I have to scrub back. I'm going to show you, we've got our, do we know the, na the name of the, the man's name? Anson Gregory. Oh, there he be. Um, are folks familiar with the um, the monument out on Old County Road at the Nativity Lutheran Church, right? So this is not this is beyond a myth. This is uh, seated in our local history. This is a story that people really enjoy uh, telling, right? Uh, so now Michael Crandall is the, he also has his connection to the story. I can scroll back to it. Okay. I'll just read some excerpts because I just love the style of writing and he's um, was really generous in giving his time to this project. Okay, so you see here. Oopsie. Donut Feast. In May 1861, the 3rd Regiment Main Volunteer Infantry set up some 80 canvas tents on the board on the broad lawn of Augusta's state capital to get ready for the influx of recruits arriving to join the Union Army. In a scene that was repeated across the North and South, Maine's teenage boys and young men walked or hitchhiked, or hitched a ride to the Capitol. Some, I expect, signed up for a sense of, out of a sense of duty, but others were probably just bored with life on the farm. And I bet many of them joined, joined to snag the $100 they'd get as a bonus for enlistment. In Maine, some towns offered an additional bonus of 200 for a 17-year-old farm boy, the chance to collect the equivalent of six years' wages must have seemed like a good deal, at least at the time. As the mud cake farmhands and salt-crusted fishermen trickled in, they were handed brand new uniforms, overcoats, even pajama bottoms. They spent four weeks drilling, learning to use their bayonet, their bayonet tipped muskets, and marching around as if it were the 4th of July. It all promised to be a grand adventure and the boys in blue were, a to were the toast of the town. In the last full week of training, the ladies of Augusta decided to throw the recruits a party. And since this was New England, and the occasion would naturally be celebrated with donuts. Piles and piles of donuts. Donuts in so many varieties that it would turn pink and orange Dunkin' Donuts green with envy. The cooks and housewives of the city had for days been elaborating the vicious compound. Oh, sorry, pardon me, the viscous compound. <laughs> Hello, welcome. One writer later reported that the vats of dough that had to be prepared, those are the viscous compounds. Um, the event was so notable that newspapers as far, as, as far south as Baltimore picked up the story of the Feast of Donuts. The following report ran in the Baltimore Sun on June 29th. I'm going to guess it's 1861, right? Same year. Okay, 
The Ladies of Augusta, Maine, one day last week distributed over 50 bushels of donuts to the 3rd Volunteer Regiment of Maine. A procession, a procession of ladies, headed by music, passed between double lines of troops who presented, the arms, who presented arms and were afterwards drawn up in Hollow Square, a military formation, to receive the welcome donation. Never before was seen such an aggregate of donuts since the world began. The circumbian air was redolent of donuts. Every breeze sighed donuts. Everybody, everybody talked of donuts. The display of donuts beggared description. Mm. There was the molasses donut, the sugar donut, and the long donut, and the short donut, and the round donut, and the square donut, and the rectangular donut, and the triangular mm -hmm. donut, and the single twisted donut, and the double twisted donut, and the light risen. Oh, risen, it says. The donut and the hard kneaded donut, the straight, the solid donut, the circular donut, the hole, and the donut with the hole in the center. There were donuts of all imaginary kinds, qualities, shapes, and dimensions. It was emphatically a feast of donuts, if not a flow of the soul. Ugh. Well, for the boys, this donut debauch would prove a short lived prelude to the bloody years that awaited them. On June 5th, the recruits of the 3rd Regiment filed out on the train down to Washington. One in five would make it back. Michael Crondall, again, a historian you can follow up with, he just, um, yeah, this is an excerpt from a book that he wrote called um, The Donut, History, Recipes, and Lore from Boston to Berlin. So his background is in, um, yeah, culinary history of the world, but he, this is just one of his favorite accounts, and he talks also about donuts in colonial England. He just has a really incredible connection to this part of the world, even though he spends time studying the whole of it. Um, <clears throat> all right, so that's Michael Crondall. Um, let us see what's next. Okay. So let's go now to All right, 2022, it is the year we're living in right now, right, still? Um, so this is, uh, fast forward now, Whole History Show 3 just closed last week at the Portland Public Library. Um, it was, again, a open call for submissions, so a flyering, you know, locally. Um, it was also an exhibit that had been postponed for two years. It was originally meant to be in 2020. And um, I'm just going to now sort of click through a little to give you a sense of, you saw the catalog, that 2018 publication, which included the works from 2016. And I just want to sort of show like how this um, project is evolving and how um, I, I really feel that the, the project with every iteration is becoming more focused around some of the, oh, well, how can I say more focused? I mean, people that are finding their way to the project are... I think addressing some of these more critical um, issues and views that, uh, given the time we're living through, so there's sort of the work is becoming a little bit more pointed around this idea of like, basically the call that I, I ask is I say, I was told that the whole donut was singularly invented by a young boy at sea. Like what what would you need to like believe or not believe that, and what would be the sort of um, in in just choosing to believe it, what does it say about uh, who you are? And um, I just we just get the most incredible submissions, and I think that it, what it does is it doesn't it does sort of the opposite of what I said the the plaques often do, which is they sort of uh, give a, give focus to one view of history. And I think that with an art show like this, you just get many many people articulating um, why it is, uh, and you can just get a bit more diversity in that regard. Um, so here's, this is actually after we de-installed, so that's the empty gallery. Um, these are some views of the um, works. Some of these are from the 2016 exhibition and then include um, some interesting moments here where you can see this stone donut uh, was uh, created um, in reference to this piece, which is called Prototype. And so there's now after, you know, from 2016 to now, there's this really rich conversation even among the contributors themselves that's happening, which I'm just amazed by. 
Um, we have also here, I'm hoping I'll remember to pull this tab up for you, but this little gem here is, um, this is a submission from um, a, a gentleman in New York City named Luigi Fiorentini, and he runs a place called Pop Pasta. And um, I was looking through Ripley's Believe It or Not last night, preparing for this presentation, and Luigi Fiorentino's um, pop pasta donuts are in Ripley's Believe It or Not as one of like the can you believe that this guy made a spaghetti shaped donut that you eat with your hands? <laughs> <laughs> and yet it is totally rooted in a vernacular, a regional specialty from Naples. It's, I'm forgetting the name, but when I pull up the site, I may be able to show you. Um, and so again, like someone like Luigi has found his way to the project and. Um, it's probably from Instagram or something, but I love that he sees himself in the project and um, you know, I don't know how, I actually really don't know how he found it in any case, but that's that's happening. Um, to the On that side you see just this sort of homage to um, the catalog itself and some of the original um, artworks that were included. Um, I'm just going to scroll through now. There's this wonderful essay that Sandy Oliver, who is another um, food historian in our area, she did the opening essay for the catalog called What Love and Loathing We Have for Donuts. And I just feel that these pictures express that. <laughs> um, these are some beautiful culinary creations created by um, two chefs from uh, Rock City Coffee in 2018. And it, this is the, um, I'll show you, this is another submission. This was part of my, the kindling grant that year. Um, we had a, a chef artist, uh, competition, so they received a stipend of $200 to invent a donut uh, between an artist and a, a chef. And uh, we had a tasting committee with Oceanside High School students and uh, Dave and Carla Joseph, who run Willow Bake Shop, were there. And um, yeah, they, they tested the donuts, and this was the winning donut. It's called the Death Donut. And it was like, you know, clove, the really spicy donuts, and they look like death. <laughs> um, this is a, um, a donut based on Andy Warhol, for those of you familiar. <laughs> um, we had, um, there were many, there were actual donuts made for the exhibit, so this is again 2016. This is Genevieve Johnson performing infinitesimal, and you can see she actually maybe did this, uh, she may have made the world's smallest donut that day. If you look here, these are the donuts. Uh, so each, each this was this was performed outside the back of the gallery in the inaugural exhibition, and um, each uh, cake donut is um, has a different fry time. So each one there, you know, because if you had them on the same fry time, what do you think would happen? <laughs> Some would catch on fire. <laughs> They're too small. So anyway, this is infinitesimal, and also from the top, the bottom to the top of the sculpture. Um, it's a gradient of, there's that much less pigment in each glazing. So we do still have this spirit of invention here, and again, it's so, it's really important that I give uh, a minute of, um, I like to just read a minute of what Sandy Oliver shared, because I think there's, I really, let me see. This is about the love and loathing, and I think she does a, a, quite a good job of um, describing what I was sharing here, this is at a Pecha Kucha, uh, I think in 20, also in 2018. And again, just this, this love that we have locally for this story, right, and how it exists in people's minds, it's such a spirit of the project, you're right? So kind of keeping that center of these uh, talks I give, I like to share that because, you know, Captain Hansen is a real man, and it's quite probable, I think he put a hole in the donut. I don't know that it was the first hole ever seen by mortal eyes, as he claimed to have done, but I like to think that he did put a hole in the donut. Uh, we hold on to that story as something that could be true, um, but there's some there's definitely some fascinating scholarship for anybody who's interested. Um, Thomas Blondell is a uh, just a few years after Hansen uh, claims to have put the hole in the donut. Uh, this guy Thomas put a patent on the first donut hole, hole cutter, and you can find that at the Thomaston Historical Society. And it's a U.S. patent. You can look it up. So, you know, anyway, I'll share a moment. This is uh, from Sandy Oliver's 2018 opening essay to the catalog. <clears throat> I 
When Alexis Yamarino initiated her call for submissions on writing and art responding to Who Put the Hole in the Donut for a whole history show, artists responded with astonishing, joyful, and disturbing, informative, puzzling, bizarre, and beautiful. Lots of questions remain. Is a whole an actual thing? Do we want to eat donuts or reject them? Can you invent a whole? Did a whole need to be invented? Do we, what do donuts tell us about our, our history and our culture? We do not mythologize, tell jokes, or debate about unimportant dishes. The more significant a food dish or food item is, the more common, uh, the more common are wide variations of that recipe and claims of its origins. According to these characteristics, donuts definitely qualify as significant. For example, even though a donut store chain like Dunkin' Donuts has over 500 stores in New York City, still the southern-based donut chain Krispy Kreme found it worthwhile to open multiple shops in New York, too. Meanwhile, in New York, there's plenty of other non-chain bakeries whose fried donuts, who fry donuts daily for enduring public. Since we hear America runs on donuts and what, they, and what you dunk them in, we have to consider whether donuts are truly American or not. In fact, New York, formerly New Amsterdam, hello there. I'm just gonna scrub ahead a little bit and come back to these. <clears throat> Again, these are some of the 2016 uh, sculptures that were in the show. So, um, formerly New Amsterdam, um, is the epicenter, is an epicenter of the donut. Dutch colonial settlers brought the forerunner, oily pokes, did I say it right? Oily pokes, um, to North America, where they spread and flourished in nearby New England. Fried pastry, though, occurs all around the world and has for millennia, and often as a festival of food where the expenditure of fat is marked by a special occasion. Where else in the world, though, would we find people eating festi festival food daily than in, America, than in prosperous America. America is a kind of promised land left the globes downtrodden. It would have been unheard of elsewhere in the world until the 20th century. So maybe donuts aren't all American, but their ubiquity is. So I'm gonna read this here. Here we are. So, um, whole inventions. Americans adore invention and inventors. We respect intellectual property to an extraordinary degree. So a claim about inventing a hole for a donut makes perfect sense to us. And we are fascinated with the accompanying story. The moment that the creator perceived a need and devised a solution to a problem we didn't know we had. Plaques, commemorations, and an entry into the who's who of pastry problem solvers ensues. A little classic research into the early documentation of donut recipes easily displaces the tale of Captain Hanson Gregory as a 16-year-old using the top of a pepper tin to make a, to make a hole in the first fried cake. It's perfectly plausible that Hanson may have done exactly as he later reported and that he may have regretted not patenting his idea that his lawyer would have discovered other holes in the dough at the same time. Still, we enjoy our regional food stories and retell them with family and community pride. So I just share that because there is, um, right, there's this exhaustive research that surrounds any topic. And again, I, I just like this idea of coupling, um, yeah, new people's take on how certain myths find their way into more dominant narratives. So I think this is a nice place to, to go. Um, this is a submission by um, Nicole de Barber and Melissa Luke, and they had um, a third artist with them, Hannah Bell. And these two created the site specific mural for Woodwilder Hall, which is the, um, well, the Fog Building Syndicate Block. And the hall, it used to be this beautiful hallway mural. It was one of two venues that we had the first exhibit at. And these are some details of their painting. Um, it is called The Hole of Perkta and the dough catcher. And just for anyone who hasn't uh, led a public or curatorial history project before and is wondering, oh my gosh. So we're at like the 64, there were 64 submissions the first uh, round. And this last time we had uh, between 30 and 40 and then a number of returning 
folks, but this is what it looks like. Essentially, people are responding to the, the open call and saying, hey, uh, these are some things we'd like to do. <laughs> and I'm reviewing them and sort of saying, like, again, saying, seeing what part of it I can, I'd like to say yes to and feels like a good fit for the project on some level, and that is definitely the role of, you know, the curatorial hat that one wears. So this is their rendering, um, and you can see how it became this site-specific painting. Mm -hmm. Now, I just thought, um, I like this idea of, um, you know, they're writing their, they did some research around, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I just like, again, this is a great example of they brought some research of their own to other uh, folkloric traditions, uh, not at all, you know, specific to Hansen or to Maine or anything, and uh, brought it into this this story of um, yeah, Bergda, who is actually it sounds like kind of a, um, a, a someone you might not want to run uh, cross paths with. This is a, so it says, the whole of Perkta, depicted in a large scale in the shape of Hansen's American Donut, is composed in a circle of ancient figures, both animal and human. These characters from various regions where earlier holeless donuts were made and eaten. Featured at the base of the image is the duck-footed Dutch goddess Perkta. To appease Perkta, the spirits uh, would fly through her in the night sky. Germanic tribes offered donuts, the oily bulbin. Perkta was known to carry a sword and also to spin thread. While spinning and cooking, it is, it, um, it is often women who carry stories across generations and regions. Perhaps today, these spirits are dormant in the circling of the foods we eat. Um, like Perkta, um, like, like Perkta was a shapeshifter, so too our recipes shift and change in time, melding together or becoming the foods we know and eat today. So, you know, these are, again, two artists, but again, always trying to keep in mind like the capacity the artists have to kind of go deep, go weird, uh, take it in the direction that they feel most connected to. Um, I'm going to share a few more slides, and then I'm going to share some of the media from the, uh, the project, because there's also a number of, um, we have oral histories that are submitted, uh, and uh, video, and, and such. But again, this is a more, um, this is a, a work by Fred Goodsight. And Fred uh, just passed away in January, and he was a teacher at uh, CUNY. Um, I remember. I have it here. Uh, yeah, he was. Um, he taught at the City College of New York, and he taught painting, drawing, and design. And I just thought I'd read. You know, this is again. This is a technical drawing. This is a. Um, he submitted this, but it. This is one of the drawing assignments that he gave students for years to understand cylinders, perspective holes. You can kind of, you can see quite a lot there. And his work, you know, there's, I have a link here that I'll bring this to. Um, but this is, this is something, he's not an artist who makes donut art per se, but he did have a piece of art that was donuts. So he didn't really respond so much to the historical content of the, uh, the call, but was more like, I have this thing that I created, and it has donuts in it, and I can draw. And so he shared this. Um, anyway, but his broader practice is really, um, he says, uh, had said, unfolding, um, unfolding is my guiding ideas, um, is, is the guiding idea I use to create a body of work, involving making sense of shapes and findings. The spirit of evolution includes synthesizing ideas and <clears throat> images from my past work, yet to build upon the unexpected. This is translated into the found object. For me, objects in the past as motifs for paintings, such as discarded time lock, uh, a discarded time clock, work gloves, link fences, sidewalk sections, sitting dogs, landscape sites. He had says he says my job is seeing form as poetry in my findings, and I just love, I love it about this. This, this ability of, for the artist to see the same object in so many different ways and to, to um, yeah, and here it is, it results in this kind of representational, you know, it's like a mug you could pick up off the page almost. Um, and I'll just uh, attest a link here to see how, okay, oh, not connected to the internet, we won't do that. Or, what's the password? <laughs> Love to read. Oh, that, I should learn that. Okay, let's see. And 
And I do love to read. That's the digit two. The oh. two read. Thank you kindly. Okay. And I'm so glad you're there. I forgot if you're talking to the corner. Okay. Um, love to read. Oh, not I love to read, just love to read. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do, but okay. let's try that. We're in. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna do this before we're gonna start switching into some of this media, but um, I'm hoping that you'll see that the artists that find their way to the show are not necessarily donut artists or have like a again an explicit interest in history. But our, um, you know, so here's, this is a link to some of Fred's other work. The doc is hidden. One second. You know how you have to scroll down to the bottom of your screen? The doc is hidden. Let's see here. Hello. The doc. Here we go. Oh, this is a good one. This is the one that Em and I sound checked with. So Declan Clark. Uh, I'm going to share with you now. A, um, it's about five minutes, and I think I won't show the whole thing, but I, I am interested in showing this as a um, something that was in the 2016 show. And I just, he's in Ireland. He's uh, based in Ireland. I hope to meet him one day. And uh, he... You see here, well, that's what I'll share after. We're just going to watch a little, a uh, few minutes of um, a video work that Declan shared with us. <laughs> Bear with me, but I think I told you the display makes my font like the smallest you've ever seen. I can barely see it. Here we go. Donut, or an ad pastry produced, consumed, and enjoyed around the world. Though many cultures produce sweet cakes consisting largely of fried dough, the American style ring donut is perhaps the most commonly encountered. Its origins can be traced to 17th century Dutch settlers who brought with them to New Amsterdam their penchant for oligoaks, or oily cakes, large lumps of dough fried in pork fat. The donut seems to be a descendant of the oligoak. As in Washington Irving's The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, Ichabod Crane arrives at Baltus van Tassel's house to find the ample charms of a Dutch country tea table to include the doughy donut, the tenderer ollie cook, and the crisp and crumbling crullet. Indeed, as the Dutch settlers moved north of the coast of Maine, so too did the donut. Around the mid-19th century, it began to take on its now most familiar characteristic, that of the hole in its centre. In 1941, the American Donut Corporation sponsored the Great Donut Debate at the Astor Hotel, New York City. A panel of judges were asked to discern who put the hole in the donut. There are a number of stories as to the origins of the donut hole, and there were two major contenders. Henry A. Ellis claimed the hole was created when a now set Indian shot an arrow through a pilgrim woman's fried cakes. The woman fled, but on returning later to the boiling vat, discovered the first ring donut afloat on the surface. Captain Hanson Clark Gregory 1832 to 1921, 
is long believed to be the sole inventor of the Donut Hole by the people of the Camden Township, Maine. The area's youngest ever sea captain at 19, he sailed regularly from Camden Seaport, and though the great Donut debate judges ruled unanimously in his favour, there are a number of different stories as to how he came to put the hole in the Donut. One states that as a young boy, Gregory overheard his mother complaining that she could never cook the centre of her donuts completely to her satisfaction, whereupon her young son suggested she poke the centre out, thus giving rise to the now famous hole. A second story claims that after losing six crewmen who had fallen overboard, but were unable to stay afloat because of an excess consumption of stodgy dough, Gregory ordered the cook to remove the centre of each fried cake. This story was given further credence, when rock-like objects were dredged from the Camden Harbour and were found to be petrified donut remnants. The subsequent ring donuts became known as life preservers to crewmen. The third story states that while manning his ship on a particularly stormy night, Gregory was forced to spear his donut on the central spoke of the ship's wheel to regain control. The wheel of his final vessel, the Donati, shown here, was found to have a considerable ring of grease around its centre spoke, leading many to believe this story to be the true origin of the donut hole. By the 1940s, the donut had reached the peak of its popularity. The 1940 World's Fair proclaimed it the food hit of the century of progress. Exported back to Europe by the Salvation Army during both world wars, US troops became known as Donut Boys. Back in Maine, a donut festival had been arranged in Gregory's honour. Events included a pilgrimage to the Gregory homestead and the coronation of a donut queen. <laughs> so I'm going to pause because here we have we have the, um, the, again, this is I spoke to, it's kind of an abrupt stop, but I need to show you this. Oh my god. I wish you could see my little, where's the cursor? <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, here we go. Here is, did you check, you saw in that line it said, the donut queen, Ellen Cooper? Yeah. Here she be. Um, so, again, that is, you can read the caption yourself. Um, so just a bit, a bit more about Declan Clark. So Declan Clark was born in Dublin in 1974. He studied at the National College of Art and Design. Uh, he works predominantly in the medium of film, but has worked frequently with other media throughout the last 15 years. His films reflect on everyday experiences and contrast these with the grand narratives and explorations of the historical edifices of political power. In 2012, Declan was shortlisted to represent Ireland in the 2013 Venice Biennale. So my hope here was to show, you know, so that the, the medium of Declan's work is to take on the authoritative voice of the presenter and to share a, a, set, of, a set of information that could be, you know, today, even, you know, some years ago, there wasn't a word for it, but it's more considered to be like culture jamming or media jamming or, and it's really not with the malintent of like, let's pull the wool over everybody's eyes. But there is this uh, element to the work which says, like, again, how do you believe that? What would you need to, uh, what do you need to know more to kind of defend that fact for yourself? And I feel that that is so much the power of aesthetics in art and how that's come into play. So. I'm gonna just see if I can't get my. Hello. Hello. Um, here we go. So again, just that none of this happens in a vacuum. People are talking about Declan too. This was a 2012 uh, paper that I found. This sort of talks about you know, both the the value of an artist like Clark, sort of saying that his his work is about. Uh, here it is. The art critic said. Such an art, like an art word, arty art. <laughs> art is talking about art, talking about art, which I love. But also, so yet a work of art's aboutness is what makes it matter to us, and what will continue to make it matter follows from the inference of intentions that are. I don't know who this person is. Probably a scholar. Uh, not all attributable to the psychological state of mental events with the author. Anyway, I, I share this because I, there's always more to the story. And so, you know, someone like Declan Clark, again, not existing in a vacuum. Um, I love the work, I will say. I'm not, I said, oh, I don't editorialize. I do happen to love Declan Clark's work. And the thing I really like about it is the, um, 
it's attention to just keeping people on their toes. It's this idea of like, why are you forming your opinion about this thing? So it is, uh, I want to show just a few more shots of the Portland Public Library exhibit. Um, this is a piece on the left called um, Donut Monument for Glen Cove. And it's based on, um, it's Rafi Baeza who teaches over at Maine Media Workshops. And it's, it is based on um, a true thing. There was, you can see it in the book when you go into historical society, but there had been a proposed monument to the captain. It was meant to be, oh, I don't want to misquote this, just a moment. It was going to be like 50 feet tall and visible, visible, like, you know, many hundreds of miles or 100 miles out to sea, um, illuminated and an illuminated plinth, um, like the Statue of Liberty. And it was never built. And I thought, you know, there's a beautiful sculpture in my cat for it. Victor Cahill is attributed to having done that. And so I would like to see that even if we don't, we don't land that monument in Glen Cove, I'd love to see some contemporary monument to the attention that. Hansen has brought to this region around this kind of like, you know, bringing attention to the, the history of the hole in the donut. So if not a monument to him, I'd still love to see some sort of monument to history itself there. Um, These are some more of the paintings. Just to show you that there were some more like pictorial everyday uh, submissions. Now for one of my favorite pieces. Here on the pedestal, is the work of Kristen Millett. This is a video. So Kristen, Kristen Millett is a professor of sculpture at University of Pennsylvania. And I thought I would just show you, again, I'm trying to, I, I think I'm gonna run out of time to share the, all of the artists, but I hope that this reflects my enthusiasm for each and every single one of them. So Alexis, if, you, uh, if you're curious to learn more about the recent artists and projects, Alexis, was exactly. that the sound of indigestion that last <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Yes. It is an endoscopic video. And so Kristen Millett, again, this idea that I would show you some work that isn't, um, she doesn't make donut art per se, but she found her way to the show because she has, I'll read it to you. She has an interest in, um, here, I'll just read it. So I should be able to click on some of these for you. Let's see. Mm. Maybe not. Essentially, she, I can go back to the other side. She's um, an artist who's really interested in the history of medicine and the investigations um, that essentially her sculptural process incorporates new um, advances in digital technology. Um, along with established methods of sculpture such as stone carving or bronze casting. I'd love to go see if I can get her to go back. <clears throat> oh, this is Emily Evelyn, who I also adore. Okay, well, I just, it seems like a missed opportunity to show you that. Oh my god. <laughs> there we go. Whoa, here we go. Okay, I'll just leave that there. <laughs> so, um, she works with 
Uh, new advances in digital, digital technology along with established methods of sculpture, such as stone carving and bronze casting. The resulting sculptural objects and installations prompt a contemporary cultural critique of societal issues surrounding reproductive and gender identity. So again, she found her way to the donut show, deeply rooted in, um, okay. Right? So she is an artist who does, I should say, have a commitment certainly to history, um, but not necessarily culinary history. Um, and again, just the, the mastery though in her um, her casting abilities and things. She's an incredible professor, and again, we're really happy to have her her work in the show. Um, she sent it to me before she was headed off to Australia, and then she came back from COVID. Like her whole, it, it was amazing that certain objects made their way to Maine in this like insane time that we're all living through. So hers was one of them. Um, so. Okay, my last five minutes. Okay, so where is the project going? I feel like sometimes people ask that. Um, let me see if I can't. So this is a, a work that is going to be coming to Maine in 2023. It was uh, scheduled scheduled to be here um, concurrently with the whole history show at Portland Public Library. Um, it is the work of um, Renio del Rosario, who is a Filipino-American artist based in the Bay Area. And it's called, can you see? It's called The American Dream, Renio um, del Rosario. And this work will be installed at Space Gallery in Portland in their window exhibition space. and. What you see here are works and ceramics, this are his works, uh, works and ceramics um, that combine objects with interactivity. I track and mimic market trends, advertising patterns, and consumer preferences in a deliberately low-key low emulation of a one-person business. So this is um, something, it's from a series of store projects where Renio goes to art conferences and spaces where he may have applied but didn't get in, and he'll go to the exhibits and he'll perform these pieces. And this was early on in his career. He's now um, really has quite, um, he, I think he's probably getting into more shows than when he started. Um, and he is just um, an incredible, um, I think, young um, art artist and the theoretician, really. Um, and he's really, I've got some incredible links for anybody who's interested in learning more about his work because he uh, did a series of uh, pretty engaging um, uh, conversations and webinars around uh, kind of capitalism and craft and sort of the ways that artists are now shifting away from the handmade because of uh, mass production and the idea that these, uh, these are all handmade pastries that he's created and he sells them at these stairs for the market value of the, these pastries in that community. So the churro is $2 in Berkeley. It's $2 at his table. When he's going to do this project in Maine, he'll research all the markets and the local uh, in the Portland area, and he'll sell his sculptures for the market value of the local donuts. He's just an incredible person. The, I was bummed it was postponed, but I think that it, it does start to get at some of the, um, the things I'm deeply committed to, which are. I have to close with this because I have two minutes. But I do, I wanted to share that, again, someone like Renio is really, I think, bringing the project to, yeah, the, the, the zone where I'm hoping it will go. Because, as I said, this curator, yeah. curatorial project began in 2014 as a personal, personal inquiry into the ways that my work as a community artist could more assertively combine my interests <clears throat> in, in, in interdisciplinary collaborative research models in an idiomatic fashion from the public from the field of public history and <coughs> museological studies. How is it that false, misleading, or bombastic claims of all kinds can prompt cultural and societal critique of how knowledge operates in relational spaces between faith and fact? 
His curatorial project continues to be driven by an interest to offer a conceptual terrain and an inclusive venue for discourse between the dynamics of belief and fact, and the forces of capitalism, and the implications and significance of American as an adjective. Particularly, I'm curious about the ways that individuals, communities, and societies process and confront Eurocentric views of American and world histories in ways that will enliven honest, restorative, and direct conversations that aim to destabilize the settler colonial narratives upheld and promoted by the media, cultural, and educational institutions at the local and national level, and in our everyday conversations about where we're from. So, 729. <laughs> we have plenty of time to connect further. I hope you'll join us in the Historical Society for some donuts. You can take some home with you. Um, I also just wanted to highlight that we have in our town now Ruckus Donuts, which um, Todd and his team there are creating these amazing boutique donuts. I personally cannot, I can't really even get my head wrapped around these donuts because, has anyone had Ruckus? Yeah. They are so um, beautiful. They're also so large. <laughs> They're the, like the love and loathing of donuts question that Sandy Olive has. This is again sort of a gesture of there's something for everybody. So um, I'm so glad they're doing what they're doing here because again it falls into this tradition of the donut, like the donut man being like sort of like a pillar within the community. Um, I didn't have an opportunity tonight to share some of the oral histories, but there's also always behind, behind every like baking operation, there's like the stories that that baker then carries from their families, from their previous work. And there's this beautiful submission I'd love um, at a later date to share called Nellie's Donuts, which is um, came from a guy named Donald Weston Brewer. Has anyone here spent a minute in Brewer before? Yeah, it's this beautiful oral history of um, a grandma who would make donuts. Um, for the whole window washing crew of this family. And again, it just speaks to, again, like donuts being the fabric of the places where we live. And um, yeah, so think, be sure to thank your local donut maker next time you see them. And maybe ask them about how it is they became interested in making donuts. And you're, you're bound to get a great story. 